Thank you all for coming. I'm excited to see everyone here. Um, I thought we could start with uh, a, little, a short reading from the book to sort of give you the context for what's happening and, and where the book is going. And then we could uh, talk to each other. Oh, these are, we introduced Chris and Carly. We've been friends for Over weeks. a decade. Over weeks. a decade. <laughs> yeah. um, so we thought the best way to express that friendship is to have a conversation in public with people. <laughs> And so we'll have a conversation about the book and each other and comics and nonfiction and time travel. Who gave a better speech at each other's wedding. Exactly. Which we did. And um, then we'll do some questions from, from you guys. So. Get that book out, baby. Get book out. We're in a bookstore, What's baby. This? Get that book. My new book. I can read it. Just so you guys know, you can't see this, but Ryan has signed his own copy of the book. <laughs> Is there an inscription? <laughs> Wait, it says... It, it says, says, this is my copy of the book. I wrote it, and then I signed it. It's because my wife didn't want... This one has a mark on the cover, yeah. and she didn't want me to give it away to someone by accident, like a credier copy, so I had to sign my own book. I, I have accidentally done that with my books, where I, I'll just be like, oh, like I've got a million copies of, of this book. You know, More accurately, a couple thousand. Right. Listen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then we'll... Like give them away or sell them, and then realize one day, like, I don't have a copy of the second book I ever wrote, <laughs> <laughs> and it's out of print. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> um, so this is the uh, frequently this is part of the book that is the frequently asked questions by new time travelers. This is the fictional part of the book, or is it? <laughs> Question: Will traveling to the past destroy the present due to the butterfly effect? which they made several movies about in 2004, several? 2025, 2034, and so on. Oh. Answer, no. Those films were based on a speculative understanding of time travel that thankfully is not accurate. In reality, any temporal machinery, including the state-of-the-art F3, FC 3000 rental market time machine, creates a new timeline or sequence of events with each trip back in time. Observe the following illustration, and here's the following illustration. It's uh, just showing you going back in time and creating a new timeline when you go back. You don't need to worry about that, the bookmark. Each trip to the past creates a new event sequence for the world, beginning with the intrusion of the time machine into history. In effect, with each trip back in time, you are creating a what-if universe, all proceeding from the same premise of what if a time traveler came back and visited this particular time in a state-of-the-art FC 3000 rental market time machine. When you return home, your FC 3000 will travel through space, time, and timelines, always returning you to, the, to your original unaltered history. Put simply, even the most egregious time traveler cannot affect the present, but merely an alternate one created by their time traveling. Feel free to step on as many butterflies as you see fit. Question, can I interact with my past self? Answer, yes, it is not recommended. You will likely notice you do not look as good from behind as you thought. <laughs> Please note that despite the FC3000 offering travel to any point in human history, the first instinct many clients have is to arrange an encounter with their past selves. We respectfully suggest that the FC3000 was built to explore time, to better, understand the, to better understand the origins of humanity and the potential of ourselves and our world, and that choosing to visit yourself suggests you sincerely believe that you are the most interesting person on the planet in any time period. By definition, this can only be correct in one case and is therefore likely not correct in yours. We invite you to reconsider. Question, can I give my past self lottery numbers? Answer, any lottery numbers you give will benefit another you and not you personally. Question, can I give my past self lottery numbers and then kill my past self and take their place so lottery winnings go to me instead? Yes, or answer, yes. However, you may have to answer to the authorities in that time period. Question, will being rich in the past make me happy? Answer, it might. Question, if not my past self, then whom should I visit? Answer, the expanse of hum human history spreads out before you, awaiting your curious and empathic gaze. That said, as part of our legally mandated commitment to customer satisfaction at Chronotic Solutions, we have created several Chrononauts Choice pamphlets, which you will find stored beneath your seat in the FC 3000. 
Each includes not just background information and space-time coordinates for one of our many artisanally selected points in history, but also the descriptions of the specific historical personages and precise sentences you must say to them in order to be swept up in an epic adventure. Popular pamphlets include how to get Michelangelo, Rembrandt, and Vincent van Gogh to paint your portrait for free, choose your side in the Battle of Marathon, join the, how do you pronounce it, Roanoke, Roanoke colony? Join the Roanoke colony and see what happens. The thing with writing is you can put down words that you don't know how to say, and they do it all the time, and then you're reading the book and you're like, I do not know how to read this book. <laughs> Why do this to myself? And finally, uh, a thousand and one wacky places to shoot Adolf Hitler. <laughs> Follow our guide or feel free to go off script whenever you want. Question. If every time I travel back in time it creates a new alternate timeline, so nothing I can do affects my own timeline, then isn't time travel pointless? Answer. If going back in time did affect the original universe we all came from, then it would be wildly irresponsible to rent out time machines willy-nilly to members of the general public. Alterations are not pointless, however. Remember that these alternate timelines you create in your travels are identical to ours in every way, except with the addition of you, the time traveler. The people in these new timelines are, by any measure, just as real as the people you know in your own timeline. Question. Wait. If that's true, aren't there hugely staggering ethical implications to the idea that we can create whole alternate realities, entire universes just as valid as our own and filled with just as many people, more actually, since now there's an extra time traveler there, simply for the purposes of entertainment? Answer, we have several ethicists on staff who have assured us in no uncertain terms that this is totally fine. <laughs> in addition, please keep in mind that these alternate realities are not just for the purpose of entertainment. They've also been used for mining and resource extraction. <laughs> Question, what if something goes wrong with my FC3000 time machine? Answer, the FC3000 is the most reliable time machine on the rental market today. However, as with any activity involving unstable Einstein-Rosen bridges constructed across disparate spatial temporal reference frames, there are always risks. In the event of a catastrophic failure of your FC3000, please refer to the convenient repair guide, which, makes up, which follows this page and makes up the bulk of this volume. Then you look at the facing page, it says repair guide. There are no user serviceable parts inside the FC3000. The FC3000 cannot be repaired. <laughs> the next chapter is just called, oh. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, this is a problem. If you're reading this repair guide, then you will not be returning to the future, and we apologize for any alleged failures in the FC3000, real or implied, that facilitated this scenario. If you would like to make peace with the idea that you will never return to your friends and family, please do so now. <laughs> It helps to focus on things you didn't like about them, such as their irritating habits or weird smells. Do not focus on the things you will miss, like cheap, convenient, clean, and safe drinking water, or the latest mass market portable music players. And now that you have accepted the fact that you are stuck in the past, we would like to offer you a suggestion. Since you can no longer go back to the future, we invite you to bring the future back to you. Allow us to explain that intriguing ellipsis-filled sentence. The rest of this guide contains all the science, engineering, mathematics, art, music, writing, culture, facts, and figures that are required for one human, without any specialized training, to build a civilization from the ground up. You may be under the impression that modern civilization took several million years, sorry, took several million humans and proto-humans several thousand millennia to construct. It did, but that was only because we didn't know what we were doing the first time around and had to invent everything as we went. You, in contrast, hold all the answers in your hands already. This guide will allow you to create a world like the one you left, but better. It will be one in which humanity matured quickly and efficiently, instead of spending 200,000 years stumbling around in the dark without language, section 2, not knowing that tying a rock to a string would unlock navigating the entire world, section 10.12.2, and thinking disease was caused by weird smells, section 15. We make no assumptions about what period you're trapped in or what you already know. Everything you need to build, everything you need is built from scratch, making this text nothing less than a complete cheat sheet for civilization. We at Kronach Solutions are excited to have accidentally provided you with this opportunity and wish you all the best. <laughs> Thank you. So that sort of gives you the idea of the structure of the book where you have this fictional, I call it the fictional candy coating and then the non-fictional core where you actually have a viable guide to inventing civilization from scratch. The, the rest of the book is very boring facts. <laughs> the rest of the book is really entertaining facts. Oh. No further comments. <laughs>
I like that, like, it, over the course of you writing your time travel book, it occurs to you that it is still wildly unethical to create entire universes of life forms just to screw with them. It's still And then you wrote, a, like, a sentence or two about it and then went head, and had lunch, presumably. <laughs> well, I realized at near the end of writing that, you know, this is basically a holodeck where you can go and experience adventures. From but Star Trek. From Star Trek. <laughs> we made 10 minutes I'm referencing Star Trek. Um, it's That's like, all right. <laughs> That's all right. It's like the holodeck from Star Trek, except everything is real. And it's so incredibly, like, wildly irresponsible to be doing this. But if we could do it, I think we would, because it's consequence-free for us. And if there's anything 2018 has shown us, <laughs> is that if you can get away without any consequences, people will do it. Hell yeah. Thank you for inviting me to your country. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess to start off, um, I'm curious, as someone who's known you for a very long time... Go I, on. <laughs> this is, that wasn't a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> for, as oh, that's who's, so nice. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, I'm curious like, where your interest in time travel started, because this book is not your first exploration of it. Yeah. No. You're talking dinosaurs, for one. Yeah, yeah, that's wildly anachronistic. <laughs> Um, I think it started when I saw Back to the Future when I was six and then spent the next 10 years of my life just thinking about time travel because I'd never seen time travel before. And Back to the Future, I think, is an objectively great time travel movie. And so I, it just blew my mind. And um, I spent all this time trying to think of, like, what would I do if I was sent back in time? And once you get out of the, the range of, like, I would tell myself lottery numbers. I would tell myself, you know... You wouldn't accidentally kiss your mother. No. Oh, okay. That's that was too forceful That's a denial. Movie, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. This is a sort of a side anecdote, but I, there was a time in university where I emailed everyone else I could find named Ryan North. And I said, I'm the real Ryan North. Please give me $30 to continue using my name. And most didn't reply. And some sort of played along a little bit. This one guy super played along with it. And he was like, I'm you. I'm 40 years old. You're 20, zero, 20. And so I'm you from the future. And I was like, wow, me from the future. Give me some advice. This is a fun conversation I'm having with a stranger. He was like, stay away from women named Karen. They'll ruin your life. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. <laughs> it got very serious very quick. And uh, I didn't write him back because I felt like I didn't want to get involved in his divorce. <laughs> so I guess I would warn myself, apparently. But, um, but uh, 40 is coming, right? Yeah, and I'm married to a woman named Jen, who's great. Oh, so. you better stay away from that Karen. <laughs> stay away from those yeah. Karens. Um, so I, I think if you imagine yourself going in the past, if you interrogate that scenario realistically, you start realizing there's a lot of stuff you don't know and that you would need to know. Like I, I had this idea of going back in time and saying, hey, I'm from the future. The future's going to be great. We have computers and, and, and soap. And they would say, great how do you invent computers and soap? And I would be like, I don't know. Yeah. Assuming you me. speak Middle English, you know, generously, yeah. if that's the language closest to whatever <laughs> you have. Yeah, that's part of the fantasy is I'm smart enough to know all the languages. Right. Um, and so I sort of, I wanted to you read You know this all the languages, but you can't break down how a CD player works. <laughs> <laughs> I put all my points in the language. Um, so it's it's... It's something that I was worried about for a really long time. And if I feel worried is almost too strong a word, but also a legitimate word. Like, I was legitimately worried about what I would do. You don't have real problems. <laughs> and so um, this book is... I did that author thing, which always sounds so pretentious until you do it yourself, where it's like, really wanted to read this book, so I had to write it. But I did really want to read the book. And in, reading, in writing the book, um, I got to answer these questions and like figure out how soap works and feel like... I would be a more competent time traveler, which coincidentally also makes you feel like a more competent person in the world because you know you can walk into any room on the planet and with a magnet and some wire generate electricity if you need it. And that's, that's an empowering thing, I think. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, in a very real way, this is not a book about time travel at all, but it, how to invent something now on your own. Like you could conceivably, like a class could take this book and say like, this is your science project for the semester. You have to like make one of these inventions. Yeah, that'd or be crazy. I mean, it also is like a legitimate, it is a sincere effort to answer the question of can you collapse civilization into 468 pages? So it does both. And he did it. And I did it. 
Um, but I had a friend, I still have a friend who... Oh, that's great. He's great. He read an early version of the book, and in the book it talks about one of the easiest ways to die in the past is through dehydration through diarrhea. Because a lot of diseases cause diarrhea, and that's a very... You can die very quickly. It's a very unfair way to die. And to fight it, you want a drink that rehydrates. And it's basically... Uh, it's a drink with electrolytes, which is a sciencey way to say it's got salt in it, with a certain proportion that absorbs into your uh, body better than even regular water does. It's how Gatorade works. And so you can make this by just mixing salt and water and some other stuff together in certain measurements. And he was like, man, I got really hung over last night and I made your rehydration drink. <laughs> like, All right. I was like, what? It, it, it's, it's just it's salt water. It doesn't taste good. He's like, no, it didn't taste very good, but I feel better this morning. <laughs> So, he just went and made that instead of like going out and getting Pedialyte. Yeah, he, he made himself. He flipped to the page of rehydration drink to save someone's life. He's like, I got a hangover. I'm going to save myself tomorrow. And it worked. So you can use this book both in, in 2018 CE and 2018 BCE. The whole range. Wow. You've been, you been trying that one out? Or this that, is the I'm first time? First time. Or? Just busted that out. Top of my head. Right. Enjoy. <laughs> so now before... Before writing prose, is it fair yes. to say that you were a comic boy? You were a comic book boy. <laughs> if only there were a more prestigious way to put that, but yes, I was and am a comic book boy. Um, I love comics. I love that um, the interplay of pictures and words, and I love that wh they're a great way to learn some things, especially if you don't know the language. Like if you're learning English, if you don't know what a word is, the scene might give you clues about it. The pictures might give you clues about it. So there's a lot of pictures in How to Man Everything, which they're not comics, but I wanted the visual. I can't imagine doing a book without any pictures. It feels like such a, I don't know, a missed opportunity. And I know like when you're kids, you think you read books with a lot of pictures and then few pictures and then no pictures and you're finally an adult. But I'm in my mid, early, late 30s and I... <laughs> I worked out for every year. So 30 is your early, early, early 30s. 31 is your mid, early, early 30s. And by that, you get uh, nine different ages. So I'm in my, uh, what did I say? Mid, early, mid -er late 30s? Yeah. I'm in my mid, mid, late 30s, actually. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. Only there were a numerical way of yeah. getting that precision. But I'm, 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 in my, uh, I'm in that age we we're discussing. And you'll never guess which age. <laughs> you'll never is. guess which age. And I've written. You're 38, right? I will be on the 20th of this month. Yeah, oh. I'm 37. Yeah. Check out for his wish list. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm I'm 37, almost 38, and I've written uh, two choose your own adventure books <laughs> based on Shakespeare. I've written tons of comics. I haven't written a straight prose, but it's as close as I've gotten to straight prose. And there's still pictures in it because I feel like. Pictures are great. We have eyes that can read information in other forms. Let's, let's use it. Well, and certainly pictures are almost a necessary part of any guidebook, I would think. You know, like any time you've been given instructions on anything, if it doesn't have any kind of illustration on how to actually put something yeah. together, I feel a little bit lost. I mean, I had this, this uh, hubris thing where I wrote the book. and I was like, mm -hmm. now all I need is some pictures. I'll get my friend Lucy uh, to... So arrogant. So <laughs> arrogant. I wrote the book. I'm like, this is a great book. I'll get my friend Lucy to illustrate it. So I picked out all the places that need illustrations. And I said, Lucy, uh, here's the part where you need pictures. All you need is in the text. It's such a great book. You'll be able to figure <laughs> it out. No problem. And then uh, we got to part about the internal combustion engine. And we went back and forth. It was over Christmas. It was over like the full two weeks of Christmas holidays. <laughs> where she couldn't, my text wasn't clear to make it, my text didn't make it clear how the internal combustion engine worked. And it turns out if you want to know you know something, try explaining it to someone else. And I did not understand the internal, I thought I knew it, mm. I did not get the internal combustion engine. Now I know it, and the picture in the book is a chef kiss of <laughs> beautiful internal combustion engine. We were watching YouTube videos back and forth and like flipping through books trying to figure out in what order the uh, pistons should be. Because one puts in fuel with the other exhaust. It's very simple once you have it, but there's 20 million ways you can go wrong. Um, so the picture helped both clarify my thinking of I'm not as smart as I think I am, <laughs> but also make the book a better book. A very emotional <laughs> journey for you. It was an emotional journey, <laughs> but it was fun because we're, we're both friends. And so she sort of was trying to figure out what's the delicate way to say this doesn't make sense. <laughs> Sorry, which Lucy is this? Lucy, Lucy uh, Bellwood. Okay. And how do you know her? God. Um, I'm just wondering, like, what, what drives you to pick out one buddy to oh. 
get them this to draw your bitter, engine. But he's not bitter. <laughs> oh, uh, versus my other friends who also draw. I know how to draw an engine. Is all. <laughs> well, where were you two years ago? Celebrating Christmas. <laughs> I don't know how an engine works. Uh, I've known Lucy Bell forever. I don't know how I met her. Um, but I, I, I selected her. I asked her if she'd do it because uh, she's really good at drawing boats. And her boats are very schematically clear. Like you look at them and you see what every part of the boat does. And so I pitch it. She loves boats. And I pitch it to her as it's this nonfiction book. Them. And there's one drawing of a boat in it that I'd like you to draw along with 100 different drawings that aren't involving along boats. Along with right angle gears. Right angle gears. And internal question engine, no problem. You'll get it real quick. So it was, it was a fun experience. Oh, okay. I'm just curious. Yeah. What dream? Yeah. That's, you answered <laughs> it. I don't have to. Read. So I'm curious because your background is in computer linguistics, right? That's what you studied Computation in linguistics, yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, it's the name of the field. <laughs> okay. So you studied computer linguistics. Wow. And I'm curious. <laughs> You study computer lasagna. I have, a, I have a degree in computer <laughs> linguistics, yeah. Yeah, that's what it says on your degree. Yep. Uh, Can I tell you my funny degree story as a quick aside? Please do. So, No, um, nobody here wants funny stories. This is a funny story. I wrote the book, and I sent it to my publisher. And she's like, great, all we need now is a bio. So I sent over my standard bio, which is my comics bio. This is the first nonfiction I've wrote. And so it's the like, comics bio is like, Ryan's written Dinosaur Comics, Squirrel Girl, Adventure Time, Jughead. Has a dog. Has a dog, got stuck in a hole. It's, it's an emotional journey. And she writes back, she's like, you know, this is great. She did the praise sandwich. This is great. Do you have a bio that actually has any credentials in it? Looking forward to that new great bio, like the praise sandwich. <laughs> it might have been an open face praise sandwich. <laughs> it was, yeah. Yeah. But so I realized, like, oh, shoot, I forgot. I forgot. I'll mention that I have a master's of science. And I sent over saying, oh, I, I'm sorry. I forgot I have a master's of science. Put that in. And then I thought that was the most suspicious email in the world to say, I forgot I have a master's degree. So I dug up my degree and took a photo of it and sent that along in a second email 20 minutes later, which he hadn't responded to. And I was like, this is the sketchiest thing. It's like, I was home all night, honey. 20 minutes later, here's a picture of me being at home that night, so there's nothing to worry about. Like, <laughs> let's all stop interrogating this and let's just move forward. So uh, yeah, I forgot I did three years at school. <laughs> right. Well, you were, you were writing Dinosaur Comics while you were getting that that master's, yeah. right? In computer linguistics. Double thread in computer linguistics. Right. Yeah. Have, you, have you ever um, used that degree since? Oh, yeah. When, I, when, oh, I, okay. when my thesis was accepted, it was 100 pages of uh, looking at light verb constructions. And I shrunk that down into six panels and got a dinosaur comic, a dinosaur comic out of it that day. So I literally used it. But, but that was like 2005 or? 2006, yeah. Okay. Since then, have I used it? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm justifying why you'd forget you had it <laughs> by suggesting you haven't used it. No, I've used it all the time. When I'm, I would love for you to defend that. <laughs> I, would, I would love to do that too once I think of a way. Um, I feel like, and this is sort of tying it back to the book, um, the first day of, our ma of the master's thing, they bring you all together in this big yeah, room. Yeah, the master's thing. Master's degree. They put you all in a big room, all the new students, and they say, you know, welcome to the University of Toronto. This is a prestigious organization. You're now prestigious yourself. And it was actually, I was inspired by it. They said, you're going to be doing a master's, maybe a PhD. This will take several years of your life. And you'll be focusing on a very small piece of subject matter. And you'll be learning more and more and more about less and less and less. And the joke is, is you'll eventually know everything about nothing. But the reality is, if you're very lucky, one day you'll discover something about this very small piece of information that no one else on the earth has discovered before. And if you get that, I hope you treasure that feeling. And I was like, wow, I do want to learn something new. This is great. But the, where this book comes from is I feel like higher education is very specialist. You learn a lot about a small subject matter, and you lose the generalist stuff that you used to have a couple hundred years ago when you could legitimately be a generalist and be like, I study biology, chemistry, and mathematics, and I've made progress in all of those fields because we're just getting started out. But I, I wanted to... With the book, I wanted to have that generalist knowledge of like knowing how a kiln works, knowing how an engine works, knowing how medicine works, knowing how art works, knowing how music works, knowing that like I knew at least a little bit about everything so that I could feel competent. <laughs> like, I like to feel like a competent person. And um, now I'm making the book sound like it's personal therapy for me. Big time. But it's also interesting, and thank you for reading it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so the reason I'm, I was asking about 
computer. And I didn't. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I interrupted your question. To no, no, do no. It no. My I'm own glad you, t- you tied it back to the book masterfully. Thank you. Um, I'm curious. You started. <laughs> you started doing dinosaur comics while you were in school. Yes. So I'm curious. Um, was were you always interested in writing, or or was there something about your studies that sort of shown some light on the fact like, oh, actually, I have this other area of interest that I feel like I can explore most effectively this all way. All this computer linguistics got me interested in all language. All this computer linguistics computer got me linguistics. interested in the dinosaurs. Yeah, no, I always... So when I did my undergrad, I was torn between computer science and humanities. And my uh, dad said, look, Ryan... Randy. My dad, Randy, said, look, Ryan... <laughs> You're just going to the humanities because this girl you like is going to the humanities. And Karen. I was, like, no. <laughs> I was like, shut up, Dad. I'm not doing that. Um, so I went to computer science. He, he argued that if you go into computer science, you can always do humanities in your spare time. And I was like, I guess so. And your dad's an engineer. And my dad's an engineer. Yeah, that's what yeah. he would say. That's what he would say. Uh, so follow, follow Ryan's dad on Twitter, by the way, for updates on his weight every single morning. It's all he posts. <laughs> Auto post is from he... some Wi-Fi scale, I guess. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> he used to post other stuff, now it's just, here's my weight today. Um, but so I, I did computer science, and I always wanted, I always liked comics, but I, I mean, being in my m- mid, early, late 30s, I didn't, there, weren't, there wasn't internet when I was a kid, and so you couldn't really read comics. There wasn't a comic book store in the small village where I grew up. And so I kind of liked comics in the abstract sense. Like, I liked the idea of comics. I liked what I knew of Batman from, my, from movies and stuff. But I hadn't really read comics. And then when I was in, graduated from high school, started undergrad, got a job, got a car, drove to a comic book store and could start reading comics. And so Dinosaur Comics started from me wanting to, to create comics, not knowing how to draw. And um, that has basically led to every other thing I've done in my life creatively. So if you want to change history, what you need to do is go back in time. I won't tell you the exact date. <laughs> but if you go back in time and I don't start Dinosaur Comics, then I never meet these guys. I never do Adventure Time. I never do Squirrel Girl. I do nothing. I just get a job as a computer programmer and uh, never write. I don't want anyone to do that. <laughs> yeah. <so laughs> It's funny about me and... Um, Why are you opening the invitation? I know. Me and uh, Randy Monroe does comic called XKCD. And one time we were, he's at my house and we were confiding in moments where we, our lives could have changed drastically, like those pivot points in our own personal histories. And we confided those in each other, the exact dates and times. And we were like, we just like, this is like a soul brother thing. Because now if any of us gets time machines, we're super weak to the other person. <laughs> How many times, just because it's... Second time it's come up. How many times in your life have you had a genuine moment of pause about, well, if time travel becomes a real thing, I need to know how to navigate that situation. Yeah, you seem really worried about it. <laughs> we should all be. <laughs> um, when I was writing the book, I thought... Um, Are you the only one who remembers a timeline where this book didn't exist? This, is, this exhibit is closed. <laughs> <laughs> When I was writing the book, I wanted to be, if time travel exists, this is the most dangerous book in the world because it tells you how to do everything to reinvent, to change history at any point in time. Like this, is, this will be the most dangerous book in history. And then uh, I went to a bookstore, and there's a book someone wrote a couple years ago called, literally called, How Hitler Could Have Won World War II, <laughs> The Mistakes of the Third Reich. <laughs> and I was like, second most dangerous book in history. <laughs> like, do not leave that book in your time machine. I want to, um, you mentioned this, there was another event about the book, uh, about the book <laughs> last night. We had another uh, conversation and uh, you talked a little bit about your research process and you mentioned a few books that were slightly less than helpful and one of them. Oh them, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I did, um, part of surviving in the past is just surviving and so I read a lot of survivalist books and usually those books are based off what I assume is the appealing fantasy of civilization collapsing. You know, the only one left because you had enough guns. And a lot of these survivalist books are written by individual people who have idiosyncratic ideas of the world, I guess is the charitable way to put it. What happened was, I read this one book, and it, was, it wasn't even self-published. It was like published by a legitimate publisher, presumably went through some sort of approval process. And it's like, you know, in, when the apocalypse happens, not if but when, be prepared, uh, you're going to need to get food out of cities. And... You, what you're going to want to have is, is tinned food, preserved food, because stuff in tin cans doesn't go bad. Food doesn't go bad. It's a lie from the government that food goes bad. <laughs> the reason it goes bad is because other animals are eating it. And so they're not dying. 
it just tastes bad to our human tongues, but you can eat it, you'll be fine, you'll get nutrition from it, food doesn't go bad, it's a lie. Then it was like, update to the second edition. He's like, so I, I ate some fish and got botulism. <laughs> so, <laughs> so fish can go bad, but other food is still Jury's fine. out on the other <laughs> yeah, food. I was like, what is this? Like, how many additions do you okay. need? <laughs> like, yeah. Cheerios can also go bad, but Rice the, Krispies are the fine. The book was published posthumously. <laughs> Oh, sorry to tell you folks, beef also goes bad. <laughs> yeah, so... Wait till you see what happens to wine. <laughs> so there's um, one of the things I think... I, this is my first time writing nonfiction. One of the things I tried to do was um, have more than one source. Because if I just read... Have one, more than one source for facts. So I, if I just used that survivalist book, I'd be like, hey, chapter 10, food doesn't go bad. <laughs> and I would feel pretty bad about that. Eventually, when I figured out that food does go bad. You might end up in legal hot water, too. And then it's just copying and pasting books. Yeah. 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 So two reasons to do your research. <laughs> there, there almost seems like there's a little bit of a monkey's paw element to discussing time travel. Like you, you, How there so? Are, well, there, it feels like there are all these like sort of conditional things. Like, grant, like assuming this t technology exists, like these are, the, these are the potential traps that could exist. Yeah. Yeah, in the first, in the outline of the book, I actually had a chapter on weapons. I thought, oh, I'll do some cool weapons. And the more I was writing, the more I was like, well, I want the book, it's about building a new civilization from scratch. So you can, it's all about fixing the mistakes that we made. And it felt like having a chapter of here's how you kill people in the middle of that felt really out of place. Yeah. <laughs> so instead, there's just a side note saying like, you know, if you really need some weapons, there's a whole appendix about making chemicals, and a lot of those are explosives. <laughs> They're very dangerous. You can probably make a weapon out of that. Yeah. Um, but there's, I did, I did a tech tree at the back, so how the, how the technologies connect together, what you, prerequisites you need to build the next ones. And you kind of see how, how one thing leads to another, and if you have something ahead of schedule, you can solve some problems. Like if we, uh, Europe got deforested because we started making, um, burning trees to make a, uh, to make charcoal. Mm -hmm. And it was such a useful fuel source that we just deforested Europe. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> and if you have a technology more advanced than charcoal, you can skip that step. Oh. And like, if you can build machines that do work for humans, maybe you can skip over the part of human civilization where we started thinking, let's, let's enslave people. Like there's, Stuff that we did that you can avoid. And um, if you travel through time, do that, please. You're saying <laughs> your, your book has solved slavery. Yes. <laughs> no. God, God bless you. <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious. So, so you sidestepped weaponry. Sidestepped weaponry. Yeah. Are there other things that during the research process of this book that you... You either wanted to include, but felt out of place, or felt redundant, or things that you decided. Oh, oh second yeah. Thought, yeah, there know. was one I wanted. There's a section on making usable, safe drinking water from using uh, charcoal and, and boiling it. Woo. Pardon me. <laughs> yeah, safe drinking water. Okay. And um, I, in the appendix, in the chemical appendix, there's also instructions on making chlorine gas for other uses, but it's also really deadly. And I thought, well, I'll just put a quick aside on how to make chlorinated water, which is good to keep it clean and safe. And it turns out there's a really fine window when you're adding chlorine to water that if you're inside this window, it's great. If you're outside, it's either unsafe to drink or literally poison. And I felt like having that window being so small, I didn't want inexpert people accidentally making toxic water. So that I didn't put that in the book. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. America thanks you. <laughs> Uh, I have a question. Um, what is there anything in particular that you uh, found out through the process of researching for this book that you have now incorporated into your life? I know, you're, like, you're building a house where you like, oh, here's a great way to roof a house or put it in an irrigation ditch or something, or I don't know, make you clean water without poisoning your yourself. <laughs> I don't have an irrigation ditch. Um, Get an irrigation ditch. I do have a, I mean, there's this, the city put in an irrigation ditch. <laughs> oh, cool. Sure. For water. Yeah. Um, don't stick to my narrow examples. <laughs> I won't. Uh, I did, before this book, I'd made um, clay bricks before from scratch. Because when we were kids, we, I used to go to my grandmother's place, which was on the Beta Chaleur, which is one of the coldest bays 
in Canada. It's named Warm Bay. It's like calling ice or calling Greenland when it's icy. Hilarious. It's a horrible bay. But we, there, my grandmother trying to find these two kids entertainment said, oh, just you go down to the water and make some clay. And so the process of making clay is you grab the clay that's there and then you have to filter it. So you put it in water and you shake it up. And then after about an hour, uh, the, heart, the rocks and stuff go to the bottom and the clay's in suspension. So you pour that out and you let that settle overnight, which gives you a more harder clay. Then you can repeat that process a couple, or more cleaner clay, you can repeat this process a couple times. This is what you do as a kid for fun. The, there's thin pickings on the beta shalor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, that, was, that was what we did for fun. We were making clay. It was like a, a week-long project. It was great. Um, okay. Because there, there was nothing to do. We went to the library, and they were, it was a light, it was, this is, in telling the story, I realized how sad it was. They were closing down, so you could buy all the books for really cheap. <laughs> So we bought a children's encyclopedia from like the 60s and it had all these incorrect facts. So we'd read that and make clay. And it was fun. Like I had happy memories of that. But I thought they were happy memories until I was telling them now. I'm like, maybe they're sad memories. They felt happy, but did I know what happiness was? Maybe I was confused. Do you uh, think, oh, go ahead. Um, so this is the, I would say this is the second in your, your time travel series, the first being your t-shirt. Yes, uh, uh, this is the first book, I believe, in history that is based off a t-shirt. Because <laughs> the first version of this, I made a t-shirt that's like, here's what you do if you go back oh, in time. Ha have you not read the Bitch Fell Off series? No. <laughs> I'm kidding. That's like, <laughs> no, it's like, it's like, like the motorcycle shirt, if you can read oh. this. Oh. My beloved wife fell off. <laughs> From like the 80s. <laughs> I mean, you can still see him on the highway, baby. <laughs> <laughs> We've been riding different highways <laughs> all night long. Um, yeah, so it was, it was like a t-shirt version of this, and that was sort of my first idea of that. And it, it sort of scratched the itch, but not all the way. And uh, I wanted to get into more detail, and I wanted to be like... Because the t-shirt version is kind of the fun, jokey one, like, here's all you need. But clearly you need more than what a t-shirt can contain. What, what kind of stuff is on the shirt? Uh, it's got uh, flight. I remember it has uh, where to go when aluminum is really valuable. Because extracting that was really hard to do until we figured out now it's super cheap and we wrap our potatoes in it. So uh, there, there's a place you to make wrap our what with the potatoes? potatoes? Oh, potatoes. Potatoes. What do you think I said? Tomatoes. I don't know. Any. <laughs> I, don't, I just thought any specific food was a weird choice. That's potatoes all. are famously wrapped in aluminum foil. Oh yeah, baked potatoes. Sure. We've been friends for years. Conversations like this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I've never. We're like this all the time. <laughs> You've never wrapped a potato in aluminum foil. Not just for the sake of it. I feel like we're getting sidetracked. <laughs> Like, let's just assume that potatoes are wrapped in foil and move on. So, <laughs> I will so what else is on I the I will t never assume potatoes are wrapped in foil. <laughs> uh, so it's got potatoes. It's got um, flight. It's got uh, some how to make penicillin, how to extract penicillin. How do you make penicillin? Uh, well, it's, it's basically, the penicillin's one of those, like famously Banting and Best found the... Uh, the mold that wouldn't grow in their petri dish and discovered penicillin that way. Can you imagine if the guy who wrote the survival guide that thought food didn't go bad <laughs> was in charge of penicillin? <laughs> it would never happen. Well, this is the thing. Penicillin had actually, that, that observation that weird, sometimes mold doesn't grow in this dish, had happened several times before Banting and Best. What happened with Banting and Best was they investigated further instead of tossing it out. Mm. And be like, oh, this, this mold I have seems to have some antibiotic properties. Perhaps we could extract that for antibiotics. Like, this is a where we had something we needed and then... Finally, a it. smart scientist. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, it was, it was more, it's more the abridged version. And this book is like the sincere effort to build, be what you need to build a civilization. So I'm curious if um, you feel like you've said all you want to say now on time travel, or if you feel like there's still more that you just haven't, I haven't think approached yet. I <laughs> think, given enough time... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that groans what I was looking for. <laughs> um, there's always more to say about time travel. Yeah. And I feel like, um, I mean, when I was writing this book, it wasn't called How to Invent Everything. It was called something like the Time Traveler's Survival Handbook or something. Oh, time way Traveler's better. Wife. No, no, no. <laughs> what I love about how to, how, to, how to Invent Everything is that it's a title that promises so much. Like, it's a really ambitious title. And I love that it... It's it, a lie. It's, it's not a lie, but it's a, it's a real, it's something to shoot for. Mm. And um, you don't, it doesn't have everything. It has a lot of things. <laughs> um, you could probably write how to invent everything else. But I feel like 
for that for this book you've got everything you need to build like a really cool because you want to be cool a really viable cool civilization that will be the envy of all the other civilizations you are not interested in researching inventing anything not in your book it's just you cool pick, stuff you pick the how to invent stuff shades and now you're done. how to invent like the funky drummer beat that's it <laughs> So you mentioned what's the funky drummer beat? Yeah, what I'm is the funky? So sorry. Is that oh, is that that? No, it's not that. It's a sample used in a lot of '80s hip hop. Uh-huh. You'd hear, you know it to hear it. I can't. I would I can't love beatbox. to hear it. Look it up on your phones. <laughs> you'll, you'll recognize it right away. I can't Everyone's do it. Everyone's mad at you. I no. recognize my limits. <laughs> I, uh, Don't ask an author to beatbox. <laughs> Don't ask me to Google funky drum beat. <laughs> Funky drummer. Oh, sorry. The funky. The funky drummer. Is it yeah. the, oh, oh, okay. That's is more it, specific. Is it like the boots and pants thing? Boots and pants? That's what that's what beginner beatboxers start with. You start with boots, boots and, and pants. pants. And boots and pants. This is he a, did it. He did it. <laughs> I feel like this is an aluminum foil digression. No, it might have been. Um, so, <laughs> so, so you mentioned, um, <clears throat> sorry if I'm getting the nomenclature incorrect, but Please. tech trees? Tech trees, yeah. So how I'm curious how many of those tech trees started with the same sort of seed. Uh, they there is a there's a lot that you can invent on your own, just knowing what it is, like language, spoken, written, mathematics, scientific methods, just the idea, you have that, you're good to go. But uh, when I was building the tech tree, the thing that surprised me the most was kilns and forges is the single most productive invention you mm-hmm. can have because that gives you and uh, metals. It gives you buildings. It gives you everything that you get from steel. Like it's, there's so much that comes from just turning raw material into a more useful raw material. That, if Minecraft has taught us anything, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's basically Minecraft fan fiction. <laughs> no, actually, that that tech tree is uh, the game Civilization fan fiction. Because there's tech trees in Civilization. And I was like, what is a tech tree for real life? I want to know that. So that's why I put that in. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> oh, it's really. It's really should we go to uh, questions yeah. from the audience? Sure, why not? Well, first of all, full disclosure, my name's actually Karen, so I don't know. Oh, no, Ryan! No, How Ryan! <laughs> Ryan, that's what she wants! Don't ruin his life! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you're standing in the past, given that if you're not the predominant gender or race of the time, how would you invent all this technology without getting burned at the stake? So this is the thing. <clears throat> yeah, uh, speak to your there privilege, are, idiot. <laughs> there are some periods where that is a concern. Oh, friends. There are a lot of periods where that's a concern. Um, but one of the things I talk about in the book in this section of inventing language is uh, the easiest way to invent language is to just teach it to a child because children are really good at learning language up to puberty. Like they learn first languages from hearing it spoken around them. All of us, all on our own, like profoundly isolated, invented the idea of just the idea of language, a grammar, we made nouns for it, we did everything all on our own. Like babies do this incredibly. So my advice is rather than trying to, you know, run into, let's say, Europe 1650s and try to affect positive change, it might be easier to kidnap some babies <laughs> and start a new civilization <laughs> where they can't find you. Um, Which is not covered in the ethical section of the book. <laughs> There is an ethical section. It, it's multiple choice. <laughs> um, but y- you can, the idea of, of not making the same mistakes, where you can start from scratch and do things better. Uh, you don't need to kidnap babies. It's just efficient to kidnap babies. <laughs> Ryan North, everyone. <laughs> right. <laughs> so related to that. <laughs> Related to kidnapping babies. Yeah. Like, uh, what do you think you might do if you were stranded in the past to uh, get people to trust you, or at least, you know, not merge you? Uh, it depends on the time period, uh, how I get people in the past to trust me. The, my fantasy is going back to around like 150,000 BCE, where you have anatomically modern humans, but not yet behaviorally modern humans. So anatomically modern humans are people whose bodies look like us and they show up around 200,000 BCE. Behaviorally modern humans are where we start seeing the beginnings of stuff that we recognize as human, like making art, burying your dead, that sort of stuff. There's this huge gap, and the question is like, what made us behaviorally modern? What finally clicked to make us finally fully human? And one of the ideas is that it was language. It was us inventing language. We could talk to each other, and we realize we're not alone, and we can build cultures and have relationships all from language. So what I would like to do is go to that time period and I feel like, you know, we joke about kidnapping babies. I probably would not kidnap babies. I would try to befriend the adults with 
for adults who have children, because those children are still valuable, but they need their parents. And uh, using stuff that I can build that would have value for them, lure them to my version of civilization. One of the uh, interesting theories I found was the idea that um, if you're hunting and gathering in a time period where food is plentiful, so it's no trouble finding berries, herds of wildebeest falling off cliffs all the time and just eat their meat fresh off the bone, farming sucks. You're working all day long, you're hoeing, you're digging holes in the dirt. It's just, it does not compete with hunting and gathering. So why would you start farming? And one of the theories is, um, if you want to brew beer, <laughs> you need reliable grain, you need infrastructure, you need to stay in one place for a while. And so if hunting and gathering is filling your belly, you might be fine. But if you want to have a beer, you need a civilization for that. So if I invented farming and then started brewing, I might be able to lure over some booze-loving humans. <laughs> Which, saying it aloud, it feels kind of horrible. Like, I will drug them <laughs> uh, with a mind-altering substance. I believe so, I heard Karen just suggest this is for the children. <laughs> <laughs> it may be. I'm realizing this now on stage. It may be that time travel is inherently ethically fraught. <laughs> I'm also picturing you specifically going back in time. You're you're like five feet taller than any of those people. Yeah, and that's you'd impressive. be a god. Yeah, like people, uh, people, especially people in the past, when they were people who were exceptionally high, like they get no. We still know their names. Of just like people who were unusually tall in the sixteen in the fifteen hundreds. Like this guy was six feet tall. He was a giant. And it's like. I'm taller than him. <laughs> yeah, now you got to write all these friggin' books to be famous. <laughs> but yeah, so that's true. My height would also give me an advantage there. Because I would be like, clearly this guy eats good food. <laughs> yeah. So as you mentioned, uh, comics did help, to, uh, help me to learn how to read in a second language. Mm -hmm. And I think the most useless with that would be dinosaur comics. <laughs> Especially the current ones. Yes. Uh, how did writing these change over time, and is it something of that in here? That's a great question, thank you. Uh, so Dinosaur Comics, for those who don't know, it's the same pictures with different words every day. I've been doing it for 15 years. So the pictures do not help you in most cases. They're just dinosaurs. <laughs> They're stepping on houses and cars. Um, but the one thing that, like doing Dinosaur Comics for 15 years, or for 10 years when I first started doing other comics, I realized that it made me by necessity get better at writing dialogue because that's all it is is dialogue there's no pardon me there's no reaction shots there's no anything else it's just dialogue so i feel like if i look at myself as a writer i'm like oh i can i can do conversations i may not be good at anything else but i can at least have two people chat and make it interesting and so uh for how to make everything there's not there's no converse there's one conversation in the book that's a dialogue but i could sort of imagine it as a dialogue with the reader so you're always trying to keep them entertained and keeping things moving, keeping putting jokes in if things get slow, like trying to make it something you read for fun and not just, because you can, you can do a version of this book that's a textbook and it has the same information in it, but it's just a slog to read. Because I read a lot of textbooks to write this book and it can be a slog sometimes. I want this to be the fun version of that. Uh, I, I just had it, wanted a quick aside. You, yeah. you mentioned you had some trouble with some licensing because of oh, some confusion over this being a textbook or not. I did. So. Um, one of the sections in the book is how to make music. And it starts with you know, musical theory, how to get build instruments, building up to here's how you can, you can read and write basic sheet music, with the climax being, here are some songs for you to plagiarize <laughs> and pass off as your own work. And my, my big idea was I'd have you know, Packable's Canon and Beethoven's Fifth and like real Western canonical songs, very important, fancy music. And then I'd have the sheet music for Salt and Peppa's Shoop as the last song. I was like, this is going to be great. And, and that is your favorite song. I think I it's a great song. Here I go. Just think about you. Here, here I, I go. go again. Okay, girls, what's my weakness? Men. Men. Okay, okay then. then. And it goes on. <laughs> um, so I, I, I find, I didn't contact Salt and Peppa, but I contacted their licensors. And I said, you know, you license their other songs and sheet music. You don't have Shoop. I'd like to put Shoop in. I'll, I'll do my own arrangement. I want to put it in this book. And they said, so what, is this a textbook? And I was like, no, it's not a textbook. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's nonfiction wrapped in a fictional candy coating. It's about time travel. It's all this stuff. Like, I wrote a whole, whole paragraph. And they were like, so it's nonfiction? And I was like, no, no, the science is real. And 
And we went back and forth several times, and they finally stopped replying to my emails. <laughs> and I realized, oh, my problem here is that they want to put this in one of their three boxes, and you don't make enough money from licensing sheet music to make it worth their time to write back to my stupid emails. <laughs> So I couldn't put in Shoop. Instead, I put in uh, the Tetris theme song, which is also a goofy song, but uh, in the public domain, because it's a Russian folk song, so I didn't have to license that from nobody. <laughs> That's a peek behind the scenes of making books. <laughs> All right. Um, I haven't read it yet, but I imagine that this book is, by necessity, limited by the technology that we understand in 2018. Yes. Um, <laughs> Are there any inventions that you know we, we haven't understood yet as of today that you might be happy to put in the second edition or the third edition of this book? That's a great question. I am uh, forbidden by the Time Traveler's Code to reveal anything. But actually, one of the, seriously, one of the things that I found really inspiring, and it'll take a while to get the inspiring part, but there's all these examples in the book of uh, technologies that we could have invented and didn't, where we had everything we needed and didn't put it together in the right way. Um, one of the fun ones is uh, stethoscopes. The first stethoscope is invented in, I think, the 1600s. I don't remember the exact, exact date anymore. It's in the book. But uh, it's invented because we have this uh, heterosexual male doctor in Victorian times who uh, has a busty female patient. And he wants to listen to her heart. And he's like, I can't put my ear to her chest. That's far too erotic an experience. <laughs> so he rolls up a tube of paper and listens to that instead to leave some room for Jesus. And he and discovers it's even more erotic. <laughs> <laughs> and discovers it amplifies and isolates the sound he's trying to hear. And, and that's the stethoscope. Like that, all the stethoscopes are based on that principle. And we could have mentioned that at any point when we had paper going back to 200 BCE. That's over a thousand years where we could have invented stethoscopes and didn't. It's also one of the few instances in history in which uh, scientific progress was made by someone being too horny to do their job properly. <laughs> and but it's not the last. <laughs> but not the last. And it's, 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 it's this thing where like, we had everything we needed, we didn't put it together in the right way. And there's tons of examples of that in the book. And the inspiring part is it made me think, it seems really likely that there's something right now that we have everything we need, just haven't put together in the right way. And I'm probably not going to be the person to figure out the right way to invent this thing, but I, I really want to see who does. So I feel like there's still, I, in, in my mind, I called it low-hanging fruit, like the low-hanging fruit of civilization stuff that you can describe easily and build easily because you're just one person stuck in any point in history. And I feel like we haven't used those up yet. There's still some, some new stuff that's, that's exciting and fun and achievable. <laughs> At the back, yeah. All right, so uh, given you have a lot of different projects that go on at the same time that uh, have commitments for different levels of amounts of time, how do you tend to compartmentalize your work and bounce from project to project? That's a good question. So the question is, um, given I'm doing a bunch of different projects in parallel, how do I, how do, I do it? How to keep it compartment compartmentalized, get the job done? Computer. Uh, computer. I use a computer. <laughs> um, what I do is I try to break things into like half day segments. So I'll work on one project for half a day and something else for the other half of the day. That works some of the time. If the projects are very different, I was doing one uh, World War II project, which is very sad, and then doing Squirrel Girl, which is very happy. And the mood whiplash was too much. Like I was writing really sad Squirrel Girls <laughs> and <laughs> really happy World War II stuff. So I had to stop and just do like a full day. But it's, it's a lot of just time management and trying not to miss deadlines. And this was something I wrote. Whenever I didn't have to do something that I had to be doing priority, I would be writing this book. Because this was, I just lose hours doing this book. Because it was, it was so much fun to write, which I think is the ideal. Like when you, when you start writing, you're like, I just want to keep doing this. That's, that's the sweet spot. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, it's like, it's like those kids yeah. like so like, is there like, do you have like an in-canada eyes to the art technology that we know came up as 2018? So like, is there like, is it written in your head why like, the major is packaging? You know, why you have to be teleported? Yeah, so the, the question is, the, the book, the premise of the book is that it was published in, for the Time Machine in 2043. And I found it when it was encased in solid rock at some point in the past. And read the present, I crack on this rock and find this book. And so the book is written from the point of view of a future, and not just any future, just a future in which they've invented time machines, which should be a utopia, because any problem they have, they just go to the future and see how they solved it, bring the answer back, and you're done. So um, I didn't 
exactly have problems with like how to invent teleporters because I assume they're complicated. <laughs> and a lot of the stuff, most of the book is something you can actually build. So it's not, we build computers, but that's at the very end of the book and that's a climax, everything building up to it. Um, but it did have problems where there are some parts in the historical record that we don't know the answers to, but presumably they would because they have time machines. So the way I solved that problem was in the book, there's footnotes that are from the original text, i.e. the future. And there's end notes that I wrote wherever this book I found was exceeding our current knowledge. So there's only a handful of those, but let me solve the problem where like, for example, uh, right now it's changing in 2019, possibly, but uh, right now the kilogram is based off a reference kilogram in France. It's just a lump of metal that everyone points out and says, that's however much that weighs is how much a kilogram is. And for safety's sake, they've made a bunch of duplicates and stored them around the world. And they store them in these nested glass jars for safety. And every once in a while, they all come back to be measured and compared against each other. And they're changing weights. <laughs> and we don't know why. These should all be the same weight. They oh, should not be changing over time. Haunted kilograms. <laughs> but they can't all be haunted. <laughs> so but they're a lot all of ghosts, change, man. And that, like, they're all changing weights. But since that's the reference weight, like maybe... Who knows what's going on? No. So it's, uh, it's a question that we do not know the answer to, why these metal objects are changing weight over time. And we never really measured metal objects that closely, that closely over such a long period of time before. So this is all uncharted territory. So in the book, I get to this little joke where it's like, you know, in, in the past, we didn't know why these were changing. Of course, with time machines, the answer was obvious and not worth repeating here. <laughs> <laughs> so stuff like that, let me sort of dance around the the restraints that the premise gave me. One more question. I know someone's got one more question. It'll I do, if no one There else. it is. Right. Uh, so I, just you describing like you're, you're sort of imagining the, the, creating the concept of the book, right? Which is, you know, what would I do in the past? How would I survive? Right. And then there's this sort of rebound in our current culture for sort of the uh, going back to like learning how to brew beer yourself, right? Do all those home home sort of things that are coming back. Do you, I don't know, just do you feel like that's all sort of connected to some of the anxiety we have in our lives with just not understanding like how to have that sort of like ownership of ourselves? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I was saying, maybe I said it, I, I thought it, that like writing this book made me feel like a more competent person. I felt like I'm better at being alive <laughs> now that I know this stuff. And it's, it's crazy because like, I probably won't ever need to, you know, build a calculation engine that runs on water, but I could. And that makes me feel like, you know, whatever happens, I've got that squared away. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like that, that's, that's what I hope you get from reading the book is this feeling of whatever happens, I've got time travel squared away. <laughs> like that is sorted. And I've got basic invention squared away. And it, I, I mean, I, it's, I feel it's, like it's, it's inspiring in a weird way to, to, to know that stuff and to feel like this is sorted, but I do find it really inspiring. We've been doing these events for, this is our second day now, and that was the, the first time you've sold me on this book. <laughs> Chris Hastings, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> the man who's never made a potato on the barbecue, apparently. <laughs> the Boy Scout that never made a potato in foil... You camped. Yeah, but not not the way. That All right, we're getting imagining. we're getting <laughs> the potato is going to continue to distract us <laughs> for days. Yeah. For days. Uh, any other questions? I think it's time to sign some books. Yes. Uh, so I brought with me um, some special treats for you guys. I have uh, bookmarks that go with the book, and I also have uh, these. This is my new thing I'm trying. I love it. So when I was a kid, 10 years ago, when I was a baby, um, I would go to comics convention. And there was this guy come around. He'd always be like, do you have a business card? And I would say no. And he'd be like, you'll never make it if you don't have business cards. And he did this three years in a row. And I would always just like write down my name and piece of paper and give it to him. And I got real mad at this guy. So one year I made business cards, but like one. <laughs> and I waved him to goodbye and I gave him the card. And I was like, there. And he never contacted me. And I was like, business cards are the worst. But... This new thing I'm doing is I made these postcards, and the front have prints of all the different projects I've worked on, different for each card. So it's like a nice little art print, a six little art print you can take home and put in your wall. The back is like, I'm Ryan, here's my website, blah, 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 blah. But it's the world's most pretty and practical business card. And so I brought a lot of those to give you, give to, you to along with the bookmarks. So even if you don't 
need a book signed, come by and I can give you some special treats to take home. Thank you, Ryan. Thank, Thank you, you, Carly. Ryan. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs>